<laughs> Maybe one more time here? Okay. <laughs> Hello and uh, welcome to the Sprint 47 review. Um, Sprint 47 was the uh, last feature sprint for the OIVA release that's upcoming. Um, so this week we will be making the beta, right, of OIVA. Um, and uh, this, uh, the next sprint after this, the 40, Sprint 48, is the stabilization sprint before we uh, make OIVA uh, generally available. Right. So next slide, please. All right, um, I'll go over the sprint stats. Uh, Carol, Carol will give us an update on the community. Uh, Chris K will tell us about the service UI, Greg B on providers, Dan on the UI, Greg T on platform, Alberto on the REST API, Greg M on automate, Rich on storage, Dennis on performance, and uh, Dave or Pete Savage on uh, uh, QA stuff. Next slide, please. All right, um, so 367 pull requests merged. Uh, it seems a, a lot of those, the majority of uh, the plurality, the plurality of those uh, are enhancements uh, with bugs being a close second. I assume that the next sprint is gonna start swapping out big time here. Um, so next sprint basically master or the sprint that's already started we are master is now really targeted for the f release um and the things that we need in the uh, e release we'll have to get backported um so that's kind of the, the game at this point 367 pull requests merged it seems like the trend is going up uh so i don't know maybe at some point we Start dividing this by the number of contributors or the people involved or something, and just seeing how it's, how it's going to look. Um, but I am noticing the trend starting to go up in general. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of breakdown, I'm not going to go over this. You guys can review this offline, but I think they're very similar to what we're seeing, what we've seen in the past. Um, next slide. Yeah, so if you look a few, like uh, Sprint 38 and 40, you're seeing, well, the, and especially 42, um, you're seeing that those numbers are kind of lower, and I think it's starting to trend up. Um, so I, I, th I think this whole chart is starting to make a little bit more sense. As you can see here, the, the bugs went down, that's the red, and the blue uh, went up proportionately. So um, a lot of people are trying to get in, get in features for the e-release here. Um, and that's what's going on. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, so besides the 367, there was another 260 or so merged. Um, 126 were by the QE team um, in their integration test repo. Uh, another 70 plus were in the uh, self-service UI and then a healthy sprinkling um, in you know a bunch of different repos and gems that we uh, that we work in. Uh, next slide. All right, over to Carol. Hi, everyone. This is Carol. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. So, um, since the last sprint uh, where we showed a sneak peek of the new website, um, we have done a lot more work. And um, last week we did like a kind of a beta release for the website and you can already see it live at beta.manichaiq.org we got a lot of good feedback and uh, implemented some of them already and um, we plan on quite soon a ga release so watch out for that and uh, once it's available ga there will be you know you can also make um, prs and raise issues on github so that will the work will continue but um we hope that um, I think I think so far the feedback has been pretty positive, so we're, we're really looking forward to sharing it as soon as possible. Um, with the last week in Manage IQ series, again we have uh, since it's three weeks since uh, the last sprint, we have three more new posts by Drew, Eric, and Jason, and uh, there has been some uh, pretty amazing alliteration action going on with some of the posts. So check them out. Um, going forward, also with the um, tie into the new website, um, blog posts will be tagged, so it does, makes it easier for you to find uh, certain groups of posts. For example, L 
WIMIQ will be the last Wiki Manager IQ. There's also for releases, for events, for sprints, and so on. So, um, of course, when, when the website goes uh, um, GA, the, the beta um, will, will be dropped off. So you can just ac access it directly like that. And finally, I've ordered more uh, T-shirts and uh, stickers. So if you know of any um, meetup, lo local meetups or uh, events coming up and you need some swag, um, let me know and I, I can send them to you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, quick uh, a service UI update. So we've got uh, several new APIs that are becoming available um, and Jillian will provide more details on those when we get to the API slides, but basically we're adding APIs for creating pictures. Uh, we've extended the generic request um, to use the option method. Um, we have the delete dialogue API and we've updated uh, the update API for the blueprints to be a little more efficient at sending requests. Um, uh, in addition with the self-service UI, we've got a lot of uh, foundational and tech debt work. Um, <clears throat> we've introduced uh, ESLint into the service UI and resolved the, the violations there. We've updated MPM and, and the browser dependencies to uh, factor in that we're now using Node uh, 6.7 uh, for the F release. Um, Alan uh, Wright has done some great work with updating the dev process to include um, we're now dynamically loading the resources as opposed to keeping a, a static HTML page with everything that we have in there. Uh, we're working on the gulp task to just clean those up for you know clarity, speed, make sure they're still relevant. And we've removed uh, the Ruby and Rails dependencies uh, for uh, SAS and moved over to Node SAS. Um, in addition, uh, kind of a housekeeping thing is that our GitHub issues will now be synced with our Pivotal board um, just to kind of have a more uh, single pane of glass uh, view. And that's it for our updates. Next slide. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, so there is a ton of stuff to cover for this sprint for providers. Uh, we've got updates for middleware and Hocular. Uh, Heiko is going to go over some of that. We've got containers, Google, Azure, OpenStack, Rev, um, some vSphere and vCloud networks and nuage and uh, some core and pluggability stuff. So next slide, I'll hand it over to Heiko and he's going to talk about some popular stuff. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, so um, additional to the usual smaller fixes and, and additions, we have uh, completed two large blocks that are important for um, application servers. Um, usually when you talk, want to talk to a database, um, you don't include that logic in, well, the logic itself, but not the underlying connection handling uh, in your application, but you give that to the data, uh, to the application server, which can then do connection pooling and all its magic. And to be able to do that, you add um, a JDBC driver, which is the connecting piece um, to the database. And uh, so we have added um, a way to add these to application servers. And then after you have added the JDBC driver, you create so-called logical data sources where many of them can use the same driver. And as you can see here on the um, slide, we have predefined con connection settings, um, classes and, and whatnot for the, some major uh, data sources uh, or databases that are usually in use. Next slide, please. And then um, for the JMS, so that's the Java messaging system. That's, that's just uh, messaging, uh, message-oriented middleware, and, and JMS is the Java term for it that's usually used. We have added metrics for topics and queues, so how many consumers are there, how many messages are sent, and, and so on. And then it's also possible to search uh, for middleware entries in the, the list of middleware. That's it from my side. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Heiko. Yeah, there were a ton of other updates uh, from middleware. Uh, we just chose a few of the highlights, but they had a lot of PRs this uh, this sprint. Um, over to containers. Um, so a couple of highlights there. We've got um, now policies can prevent image scans. This allows policies to kind of take over before the image, stand, image scan takes place. 
Um, and there's also chargeback rates based on container image tags. You can almost see in that image um, <laughs> what that looks like. Uh, next slide. From our friends over at Google, we got load balancer refreshment. <sighs> um, I stole that joke right out of Joel Selman's uh, PR. Thanks, Joe. Uh, next slide. And every good joke deserves to be heard twice. So we got load balancer inventory collection from Azure as well. And uh, also pagination support and the armrest gem, which is uh, really cool as well. So next slide. For opens from the OpenStack team, we got um, we can map flavors now to cloud tenants to make sure we uh, are grouping those correctly and understanding which flavors actually apply in which tenants. Um, that's in the OpenStack tenant, not in the Manage IQ tenant. I'm assuming that linkage will also come um, from the tenant mapping work that's going on. Um, we also have uh, add host hardware status. Um, we're collecting that information now and um, a cinder backup and restore actions were added to the model. Um, and I think those are gonna propagate up to the UI eventually as well too. Um, and there's UI was added to register Ironic nodes through Mistral. Mistral is the new OpenStack uh, workflow service. Um, I think it sits on top of Heat and helps drive um, some of the Heat uh, orchestration pieces. That's something we'll probably have to start looking into and understanding um, how Mistral changes the landscape of OpenStack. So, um, next slide. From the Rev integration team, we got um, host and ma host manufacturer and product info details being collected, um, and also the the way we were accessing the VM and cluster relationship um, was fixed. This is interesting because Rev VMs might not always have a host, so we can't rely on that relationship when we look up um, the cluster info. And that's exactly what we were doing before. So uh, we got a fix. It was a really tiny fix, but I think a really important one um, from the Rev side. Uh, next slide. So from the vSphere guys, um, this first one I thought was really cool. I, I didn't. It was it was a uh, kind of a last minute thing that we added for. Um, someone that was looking for this kind of functionality provisioning without specifying a host. Um, when I asked Adam about it a little bit, I kind of, you know, I was like, what does this mean? And he, he told me that we could do like auto placement on on hosts as long as um, as long as it's supported in that environment. And when we already collect that information, so we already know if it's supported or not. And I was like, this is amazing. This is so cool. So um, I was really excited about that. Um, and then uh, we're improving the host storage device retrieval. Um, and in the PR, I read that uh, on a test with 512 hosts, the inventory collection time um, went from 525 seconds down to 36 seconds with this. And Adam could probably elaborate on some of those details, um, but I thought that looked <laughs> pretty impressive, so I included that bit in here. Um, and then lastly, there's uh, provisioning with storage profile. So I'm going to steal the screen and um, pull up a video, and I think uh, Adam and or James are going to talk a little bit about the video. And do that. All right, so in this print, we fully added support for storage profiles. There was something that were added by VMware in 5.5. Uh, they basically let you assign different capabilities to your data stores, and then you can tag VMs with profiles to make sure that they're in compliance with whatever you set on the data store. So if you wanted to tag your data stores with, like, production storage, gold storage, um, you can do that and make sure that the VMs that you think are supposed to be on certain data stores are. Um, it also lets vendors implement their own profiles, so if a vendor supported deduplication, they could create a profile that says the storage supports the deduplication capability. So here in the web client, we can see the different storage profiles that we have. And here we have a VM that's on the gold profile. So if we go and we can open that up. 
and see how you could change the profile on that VM. You can see it's assigned to the VM files as well as the disk. So in Manage IQ, we retrieve all the storage profiles and inventory, and we associate VMs and data stores with them. So if we go to our VM summary screen here, for that VM, we should see the profile that it's on, and there it is on the summary screen. Cool. And I'll switch over to James because he did the provisioning part of it. Yeah, so um, now you can pick a VM with that storage profile attached. Uh, if you use it to as the template to do the cloning, and once you come to this page, you're going to see that the profile, there's a list new rigid, new control. The profile is pre-selected, mm -hmm. and the storage, pro, uh, storage data stores will be pre-selected, narrowed down to a list of uh, data store that fit that profile. Mm -hmm. Then you can pick it. Um, and then you can fill in the other information that uh, normally with the provisioning. Uh, so this is the clone page. Uh, the regular provisioning VM page will follow the same thing. The storage profile will be pre-selected and you could uh, just pick a, pick a, or, or you can change it uh, and then kick, kick, uh, kick start the provisioning. Once the VM is, is provisioned, the, the new VM will also have the uh, selected profile attached to it. Which uh, yeah. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, I will relinquish video. <laughs> All right. So on to the next slide. And now for the cloud, um, we had a. What's funny about slides is that you see a bunch of words on the slide and you don't really understand the the massive amount of work that went in. Um, this is a ton of work <laughs> that happened from uh, from the XLab team for vCloud. Um, there's a lot of different things going on here, but um, just to touch on some of the highlights, uh, they added um, cloud orchestration stack operations, so creating and deleting stacks. Um, they're collecting virtual data centers as availability zones, kind of in a cloudy sort of way. Uh, they added the event catcher, which is just a huge amount of work in and of itself, um, and also added uh, vApp provisioning, um, which also has a video. So um, even though I just gave back the video, I'm going to steal it right back. Um, give me one second, and I'll take that, and then show a quick one and a half minute video on this. And this one I get to narrate. Um, all right, so uh, what we're going to see is going into the service catalog in Manage IQ and showing the um, showing creating a service dialog for uh, based on an orchestration template. So we're going to give it a service dialog name. Then he's going to create a service catalog item based on that uh, or using that dialog. Now that he's created the service catalog item, he can uh, order that catalog item and actually provision a vApp via services. So fill in a couple details. There's the uh, virtual data center I was just, or vir yeah, did I say that right? Virtual data center I was just talking about. And he submitted it, and he will create a vApp from that. Um, and that's creating vApps in services. So 
I'll let Marianne take the slides back. And, and yeah, I mean, the, the amount of work that was completed by the XLive team was really uh, <laughs> monumental there. Um, next slide. All right, on the networking front, um, the Nuage team added uh, inventory collection for policy groups. Um, uh, Ladislav updated the, um, he created uh, service type actions for load balancers for reconfigure retirement and um, some support for provisioning. And also um, we had an update to uh, a UI update for creating subnets. And next slide. All right, on the pluggability and core front, um, we're now, we have the ability to override the default HTTP proxy. And if anybody has looked into this, there's the, um, in the settings file, you have one setting for HTTP proxy. This is the proxy that lets you get out of your internal environment and access public clouds. And we've had a lot of requests for um, allowing multiple different proxies for different clouds. Uh, so now we can override that for different um, different providers, and uh, you can set a specific proxy for different providers. Um, we also uh, Marcel created uh, he 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 had a pull request for creating default reasons for supported features, and then also making sure that known features are discoverable. And so these two things together, I think, led to. Um, allowing every known feature to be unsupported by default. So before you would have to go in and specifically say, I don't support this and I do support that, but now you can just say, what do I support? Instead of saying, like having to fill out the entire list of all the things you do and don't support, you can just opt in to, uh, to features. And then lastly, um, Gaurav added a uh, PR for updating the validate reboot guest um, previous method call to the new supports feature mix in for a uh, support tree boot guest. And that is it for providers. So over to UI. Uh, I think Dan's going to give us some updates there. Yeah, thanks, Greg. All right, so uh, user interface area tends to <laughs> not follow the trend uh, when it comes to the uh, releases. Um, if you can see here, we, we fixed more bugs and we made enhancements. Not that we didn't make any enhancements. We have a list of those coming up. But um, we tend to uh, follow uh, the back end as things get done. So some of our enhancements uh, get pushed to the wire. You'll see actually see a couple of our, our enhancements coming in uh, next sprint, actually in the next couple of weeks. Um, so you can read the numbers there. But um, we did get some tech debt and refactoring done. Bunch of toolbars um, have been redone. That's an ongoing effort and uh, trying to bump up the percentage on how many of those get done. Uh, in the middle of that also, uh, Pulled the uh, RBAC checking out from the toolbar buttons into, you know, into a separate area so it's easier to work with. And one more tree got done. Um, we're we're uh, getting really close on the trees as well, getting them all converted to the tree builder. So next slide for enhancements. All right, so uh, we had cockpit integration in the ops UI. It was uh, finalized for the service UI in the sprint. Um, something that creeped in from the side, uh, we do get some uh, scope creep. Uh, we updated the OpenSCAP uh, results styling. Um, added uh, tagging for the uh, vSphere distributed switches that we added last sprint. Uh, the about modal made it to the service UI as well. Um, the notifications are now functional in the operations UI, and uh, David will do a demo of that. Um, they're functional in the UI. There's a uh, several places that they're being added to that actually generate notifications, so they're not, uh, um, you know, 100% implemented. That'll come over time, uh, but uh, it definitely uh, looks really cool. Um, also snuck this one in, uh, new improved timelines. So we basically replaced the old timelines. They were getting outdated. Uh, the upstream was, was not being maintained, so... Um, we worked with UX, and again, this last bullet here, thanks UX team for work on both the notifications and timelines. That was a highly collaborative effort on both those areas, and the results are great. So let's go to the next slide. All right, 
So here's a quick, it's real easy to see the benefit there um, using the pattern fly, pattern fly labels for these results. Um, you can actually, if you look squint, you can probably see that there's actually four levels of, of results there, but uh, very easy to see um, which ones are green and red and, and yellow. Next slide. All right, simple tagging for the VDS uh, support that we added. So you can see there, you can actually tag these things now. Next slide. There's the about modal, very similar to uh, what's in the Ops UI, actually identical to it except for the information. Next slide. All right, so we've got two demos here. I'll actually, uh, I, I put two slides, but we really don't need them. There's one for the, for the uh, notifications that uh, David's going to do. And then there's one for the timelines that Harpreet is going to do. So let's uh, hand it over to David and he'll walk us through the, the first demo. Yes, so can you see my screen? Can you hear yes. me, guys? Yeah, we can hear you and your screen Great. is loading. Ready to go. Okay, so let's load it. Now? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, you're good. Okay, so as you notice, we have a new icon on the top right corner for opening the notification drawer. And now it's fed by the API. So you can now display notifications that happened in the past when you load the page. You can mark them as read by clicking or delete them. Uh, or mark all as read or click, clear them, delete from the database. And I'm going to cheat here. Uh, because we aren't emitting any notifications, but uh, if you have an open uh, Manage IQ appliance and you receive the notification in the meantime, then it's going to send by WebSocket and display it as a toast. And if you ignore the toast, you can still review it in the drawer. I'm going to send more. If you click on the X on the drawer, then it just marks as read. It doesn't delete it. And that's all. Thanks, David. That's great. Um, yeah, so that uh, notification drawer we're going to start using for probably uh, replace the flash messages eventually, but for any kind of notifications that are done asynchronously, it'll be a really powerful thing. You know, you start a VM now, we tell you that it's been initiated, but you never know if it's done, right? This way you'll 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 be notified that it's done. It'll be sitting in the, in the drawer so you can check later, et cetera. Great, great enhancement. All right, so next we have Harpreet uh, is gonna show the timelines. You ready, Harpreet? Yeah. See my screen? Um, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Now? <laughs> no. Hmm. How about now? Yep, it's loading. Okay. Okay. You're good. Okay. Um, so we have replaced um, all the timelines across the product with pattern fly timelines. And I have a short demo to show new timelines on two of the screens. So I'll start with the host summary screen. Okay, there we go. So on the timelines um, screen, the default options are to show the timelines for the management events for the power activity group. And you can switch to policy events timelines. I don't have a data for policy event timelines, so I'll probably switch back to the management events. And in the new pull down, you can, um, we have a live search. You can search for the event groups, or you can select or deselect all of them at the same time. And I'm going to select a few of them. And you can add or decrease the number of weeks, days, or months for the data to pull. 
can position the date to the centered or end or starting point in, on the timeline and then hit apply button. So now we have um, all the event groups that I selected on the left that shows the count of the events that are on, e are on each group. And on the timeline, you'll see a bullseye if a event has more than, uh, if a group has more than one event and uh, you can click on the bullseye and it should show the table below the timeline. And if there's just one event on the timeline, you can click on the event and it will show the timeline event bubble on the top as well as at the bottom, it should show the details. And we have some hyperlinks in the event bubble. You can also zoom in or zoom out on the timeline using the control on the right. And now I'm going to switch to the next screen that is a reports based timeline. So on the reports based timeline, you should be able to see the number of total count of events on the timeline on the left. And um, also just wanted to point out that uh, at the bottom, you see the blue bar. You can use that as a slider to slide to the events. That's another way to zoom in or zoom out. And that concludes my demo. That's awesome. That's great. Um, yeah, we've been uh, trying to find a replacement for timelines and uh, with the help of UX and they actually created this timeline based on some other some other uh, tools that they found, but added a ton of features to it. So great work. It has all the features that we had before and uh, welcome any kind of feedback on it. And we'll keep improving it now that it's a maintained maintained piece of code. All right. Hey Dan, right over hey Dan, uh, that, that timeline stuff that we replaced, that's from like many, many years ago, that simile timeline, is that what it is? Yes, yes. Many, many years ago got uh, taken over by various different groups. I think it ended up in Google, but I don't think they're maintaining it. So. Okay, cool. Very, very cool stuff. Wow. Thanks, guys. Okay. Yep. I'll take it here. You. Yep. So, uh, platform team, been busy. 92 PRs. This, this sprint, we topped the last sprint, I think it was 70 something, which was a, a big sprint. Uh, mostly enhancements, some bug fixes, and a lot of refactoring. Um, so we've made progress in chargeback. Talk about the notification stuff that you just saw. Um, tenancy, central admins getting some good progress. And we're featuring a demo from Nick. Then I'll turn it over to Alberto. Next slide. So um, we, we continue to work on adding uh, support for services and chargeback. And the purpose of this is so that we can able, enable the, that's supposed to be SSUI <laughs> on the third bullet, enable SSUI uh, display of service costs over the last 30 days. Um, and so um, Yuri has worked on uh, adding a, an instance method to the service class so that they can generate a monthly report based on the service. So it would be limited to service and show um, the cost of the service and then the VMs within that service. And then he's added a daily schedule that generates that generates the report for each service that's in the system. Um, and then he's uh, in progress working on the uh, REST API that the SSUI will use to get that information. All right, next slide. So uh, Dan talked about the notifications. Uh, Shimon has been working on all the back end support for that. Um, this sprint, he's added uh, the ability to um, provide a hash for dynamic substitution um, in, within the notification met, uh, messages. It gives much more flexibility for creating uh, new event types for notifications. Um, and he's working on <clears throat> generating lifecycle events so I, that that just missed the sprint, so that's in progress. Um, that's that's the stuff that David had to do manually. All right, next slide. Okay, 
on on tenancy, uh, Libor has added the last couple of things for finishing up the uh, the work he's doing to map cloud tenants to manage IQ tenants. So just a couple of things here: um, preventing deletion of tenants that we created uh, by mapping them to the cloud tenants from OpenStack. Um, and he had a checkbox on the provider uh, configuration for enabling the mapping. And by default, it's it's off. Okay, next slide, please. Also in tenancy, um, like Greg B said before, there's this a couple bullets on this slide, but uh, it was a lot of work and there's a just a ton of refactoring and preparation work going into this so we can actually get started on doing the ad hoc sharing of resources across tenants. So Chris and LJ have been heads down on this for a very long time and got all the back end modeling in just at the deadline and um, the implementation of ad hoc sharing is in progress now. Okay, next slide, please. And for centralized administration, um, we are making some serious progress there too. So now we have uh, VM power operations and VM retirement that can be initiated from a global region and processed and executed on the remote region. And we're leveraging the new Manage IQ API client gem to do that, and there's the, the link. And Nick is going to demo that, I think, on the next slide. Okay, let me share my screen. Hit it. So we're going to start, we have replication configured. We have three tabs. Um, this one's the, the global. This is the remote. We have our three VMs we use for testing. Um, we can also see those VMs have already been replicated up to the global region. Uh, so we got our VMs there. Uh, so we can go ahead and do a power on of this particular VM. Uh, so that's starting. Uh, we could jump over to the vSphere client, make sure it actually happens. So that is the VM in question. It is quite tiny. And there it is powered on. Uh, so it's powered on on the remote side. Uh, we will refresh the page and we can see the change got replicated up. Um, we can power on two VMs at the same time. Um, and that should go through in the same way. One refresh, two refreshes, there they are. <laughs> um, so we can refresh here and we can see the change on this page. And then if we refresh on the global region, we can see that got replicated up. Page would refresh. I declined movie magic for that one. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Um, and then we can also do a retire now. Uh, so I could find the right button. We can do retire now for our first VM. Uh, we can go over to the remote region. And if you look down in the lifecycle box, we can see that that VM goes to retiring and retired. So that VM got retired. And on the global region, we can see it's retired there as well. And that's it. Awesome. I just wanted to uh, mention too that it's a cross-team effort going on here. Nick, Alberto, Jason is working on it, Brandon, Drew B. So yeah, and uh, in this sprint we're working on uh, provisioning. Okay, I think that's it for platform. I turn it over to Alberto. Alrighty, on the API side, we've uh, bumped up our version to 2.3.0 to uh, correlate with the OI release. <laughs> and let's see, so this past sprint, Tim has been head down continuing the uh, refactoring, and uh, we got 13 PRs merged where source code is in a pretty good, uh, pretty good shape now there. Uh, as mentioned, the we had also good progress with the uh, API client. Uh, Jason and I pushed that puppy a bit forward. 
So we got uh, you know, basic authentication, uh, the AR relation like uh, query interface, uh, resource actions, collection, uh, also creating resources and bulk actions. So that's uh, working good there. So uh, currently used by central admin. Um, so we, there's still quite a bit of work to do. Some of the GitHub issues have been put there. So ongoing work, but good progress. Uh, next slide, please. Alrighty, so in this uh, this print, we've introduced a new uh, primary collection API automate, um, and that's to be used for um, querying the automate model uh, later on in the SDUI for listing the uh, uh, state machines uh, endpoint selections. So that's available today, um, and also, um, yeah, Shimon also added the uh, action on the um, API automates the, dom the domain um, resource to be able to refresh some source, so to be able to trigger things like to get refreshes on that. So here are the queries, just listing some of the capabilities to query the automates, uh, listing domains, individual domains, and you have an arbitrary tree search uh, provided with a depth parameter. Uh, that'll give you the whole subtree, or if you're only interested in uh, the subtree that reflects state machines, there's a search options parameter that was added. Okay, next slide, please. Oops. Uh, one back, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the, Aparna did an enhancement on the uh, API entry point uh, to provide the product info. And you saw that earlier, that's shown in the, uh, the about model. Um, also, one additional enhancement for compressed ID by Shimon. We honor now the compressed IDs and the resource um, um, specifications. So you can, you can put the uh, compressed IDs within the, uh, uh, within the post, not just in the URL. So, okay, next uh, slide, please. Okay, so bulk queries, we had introduced that last sprint, but that was just for ID and href. We now support the attributes. So grid if supported by the model and the other ones here specifically listed for groups, users, and roles. We can enhance that as needed, but that was uh, requested by the field. Okay, and next uh, uh, enhancement uh, that was by Shimon, we needed to be able to delete notifications. Um, so when these requests come in, it's um, it's affecting basically the notifications of the authenticated user. So you can only delete your own notifications for obvious reasons. So here we have the delete the HTTP action or the post action on the resource or bulk um, bulk deletes. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and uh, yeah, we have a couple of enhancements came in from uh, Lattice. So uh, here we've uh, added the new primary collection for orchestration templates, and we have full CRUD operations on that. It was a good enhancement. And the other one, the ability to create services, uh, standard signatures, but that's on the API services endpoint. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'll pass on the mic uh, to Jillian for her enhancements. Awesome. Thanks, Alberto. Um, yeah, so we've added the ability to delete service dialogues via both post and delete, and um, post supports both multiple and bulk resource deletion. We've also updated the blueprint um, create and edit. So previously, you would pass the bundle to the bundle element, but now all that information is just being stored within the UI properties. That includes the service catalog, the service dialog, and the automate entry points. Um, we've also added the ability to create new pictures. It supports JPEG, PNG, and SVG, and you can pass the extension, and you pass um, the base64 encoded image to content. Um, next slide. And lastly, we've also added support for HTTP options on collections, um, and that passes back the attributes, the virtual attributes, and the relationships for a collection. In addition, we also provide um, the ability to add optional metadata on a collection, and right now that's provided for both arbitration rules and container deployments. And that's about it. 
Thank you, Jillian. To the next slide, please. Yep, so over to Automate. Uh, in this sprint, this is one of the changes we had, we had made the change to include Azure within the cloud provisioning methods uh, in the previous sprint. And this PR was in there, but we didn't get it. Uh, it was not merged until this sprint, but uh, adding Google in there to allow people to override the, uh, the methods run during provisioning, which uh, required the schema change. So we got that in this sprint. Very simple. Uh, next slide. And then on the services side, we added the power operations. There was some support in there previously. Um, I think this the coming sprint, this will be exposed within the UI, but it kind of works two ways. One, if you have just a service item or a single service, it will pass the requested operation down to the resources associated. So most, most likely VMs, but it, it validates that the resources uh, respond to the, the operation we're passing down. Um, service bundles is where it gets a little more complex. Uh, we've always had within the UI, as you're adding resources into a bundle, the additional um, actions and delays that can take place during starts and stops. Uh, so those are now being honored with the, the timeout values and on a stop, they're run in reverse. Right? So um, yeah, I think that's it for that one. Next slide. So a couple kind of in progress here at the top. Um, we added a top level namespace into the uh, MIQAE namespace model, which is uh, shared with the domains or really uh, automate domains live in that same table. So this is going to be used during uh, pluggable providers to allow us to filter out domains that we know don't apply when we're processing something like a, a VM uh, provision. It, it really ends up being a performance improvement that we don't have to look over every domain if we know we're not going to be finding elements in there. So there'll be a, a, an additional PR to start using that. Um, and we created a table for service connections, which is something we've been talking about. Um, we just added the table right now, but we've been discussing modeling and stuff, uh, which will allow us to take service templates um, and relate them with uh, metadata in between. So examples would be something like connecting a, a VM service template representing a VM to something like a load balancer and, and defining what ports it should use. Um, you know, Ansible tower is another one um, where we'd have VMs connected to a, a tower service um, and allowing those to provide additional metadata. So that'll be coming in the future sprint as well. And the last one was a really a fix that I wanted to point out. Um, in Automate, there's a number of places where we pass the user in, but we never actually set it and used it, uh, I guess, and we would pass it to the methods, but not really be using it internally. So there were points where if you're creating provision requests within Automate, the user would end up being admin and would pick the wrong tenant. So that was corrected by setting that. And it's also being used other places. So our back will need it as well as um, on the next slide. Um, start talking about uh, generic objects using methods, and it was required there as well. So, and the PR numbers there, if you'd like to look that up, there's a related BZ ticket that describes the the issue we were fixing there. Uh, all right, next slide. So for generic objects, this sprint we got in uh, being able to call methods on the objects. And just a few details about them. The, the contents are stored within the automate modeling. Uh, the generic object really just defines what the names of those methods are um, so that when we get called and, and intercept that call, we know to pass the data over to automate. Uh, we support returning data back from them. And the way the domain ordering works, if you have different tenants, um, each tenant can have the same method available, but can actually perform different operations if you need to override the logic <coughs> for each uh, each tenant. Okay, next slide. So I was, I was going to have you sit through another demo, but that unfortunately had some technical difficulties. So uh, <laughs> you get slides this time. So maybe I'll have it together for for next spring. Um, so here I wanted to show the, the automate modeling that we merged in. It's basically an example um, 
under the generic object namespace um, gives you a sample uh, state machine that you can use pretty pretty basic a few steps um, if you want to use that or not but you wanted to give somebody people basically a starting point to to go from so it'll show a little bit more in the next few slides next slide um, so here, all of the generic object stuff, you, you'll create the definition within the UI, which is being worked on and, and would be going further if my uh, developer didn't get pulled into jury duty, but we'll, <laughs> we'll ignore that for right now. Um, but the objects themselves, so I, I've the line four there, I have a generic object definition called load balancer that I've predefined. Um, I'm gonna get a handle to that class and then on line six, basically create an object the, the first two values, name and UID, are, are part of the uh, table for generic objects, but the rest are all defined as part of the definition. They don't really have existing columns. They live within a JSONB column for that object, so we can add in, you know, add columns dynamically to that class. Um, and then down below, just making the association to this load balancer, load balancer generic object I created. Uh, connecting it to the service and then kind of reversing it is is having the load balancer have a relationship back to that service. Um, I think we've talked about this before. We added relationships, but they're all as many, so it's always an array of services, even if you're planning to only have one. All right, uh, next slide. So here was... I. In my demo, imagine a service connected to custom buttons. Um, so here I wanted to take a VM and associate it to the load balancer. And this is the kind of method calling. So I basically get a handle to my service. The generic object is stored as part of that service. So I'm looking that up and, uh, and I'm calling add VMs, which is the method I've defined. And down below, the second image there shows that method instance within uh, the generic object load balancer class, which is just a copy of that example one. Um, the execute call there, I'm, I'm calling a method, add VM, and then it gets a little trickier here. All, all the parameters that we collect from the caller, line, what, line five above, basically get broken down into param, you know, param numbers, param one, param two, and passed into automate that way. So I'm calling that method and passing VM in as that first parameter. So I, it, you know, it's an ID basically coming through, and it'll make a little bit more sense on the next slide, I hope. So here, a little smaller, but at the bottom, uh, input input parameters you can define the parameters that the method needs and more importantly, the data type. So here, the, the way I was calling it on the previous slide, it would take that VM parameter and look up the VM by that ID and pass it into the method. So I don't have to do anything to go load that VM. It would just give that object to me in the $EVM inputs uh, VM line. That's line three there. So that's kind of option one I wanted to show that. I, since I'm calling a method on the generic object, the generic object is part of the root uh, properties that are passed in. And then in here, I'm not doing anything to actually talk to a load balancer, obviously, but I'm just making the relationship here. <clears throat> and then I wanted to show option two, which is if you don't set up all the parameter passing, all those parameters end up in the root object that gets called into automate. So if you wanted to, you could pull the ID yourself, look up the VM, and then do the same type of logic. Um, I think there's a lot of things we could do here with, you know, you could pass YAML strings and kind of reconstitute them on the other side and have all kinds of complex um, logic going on there. But just wanted to give an idea of what what the setup looked like and, and how the process was flowing. I think the only thing I didn't include here was a, a return object, but like I said, you are able to pass properties back to the caller as well. And that's my demo. Thanks. Thanks. I didn't even have to grab the screen.
All right. Next. Before, before Rich starts, there's a question for you from Kevin, Greg. No, <laughs> impossible. <laughs> Um, the question is, is there a relationship or association from your service to the generic object in the UI then, or just in Automate? It's not in the UI yet, but it will be. The plan is that all this stuff will be exposed in the UI. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Um, in this sprint for this release, uh, we've implemented initial support for general uh, storage manager support, um, and the intent here is to support managers for physical as well as software-defined storage and um, basically have the ability to associate those managers with one or more different providers um, or provider types as appropriate, for example. Uh, Cinder can be used as usual in an OpenStack environment, but it can also be used, say, in a Rev environment or an overt environment. And uh, the Swift Manager can be used in the um, OpenStack environment or standalone as a Swift, Swift Stack uh, provider. Uh, and, and of course, physical storage, virtualized storage arrays can have their own managers and be associated with various providers uh, as required. Um, <clears throat> uh, Initially, the first managers we did were OpenStack specific, and we made a Cinder manager and a Swift manager under OpenStack. Uh, that will be uh, probably extended, as I mentioned earlier, to support standalone and association with other managers. Um, also, given the availability of physical storage managers going forward, the concept of having an environment with multiple storage managers. Uh, would also uh, be supported. Uh, we also did our best, as Jerry will show, to get some initial uh, user interface support for this as well. And we'll have a demo showing that uh, a little later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, for the Cinder Manager, it's uh, initially associated with the OpenStack provider, but can be changed uh, going forward to support Rev, standalone, uh, and other uh, environments. Uh, we generalize the cross-linking, so depending on what type of environment it's associated with, it'll make the appropriate uh, cross-links in the appropriate manner. Uh, so uh, Cinder Volumes will be a link to uh, the backing of instance disks and tenants and availability groups as, as appropriate in the OpenStack environment. Next slide. If, similarly, for the Swift uh, environment, as I mentioned, can be associated with various environments and standalone. And currently, for OpenStack, uh, the only external crosslink we do are to uh, tenants. And that brings us up to the demo, I believe. Next slide. I'll turn it over to Jerry. All right, can everybody see this? Not yet? Yes. Yes. There you go. There. <laughs> okay, so let's get this rolling. You know, uh, first I wanted to say it's really refreshing for me after doing demos for uh, um, policing smart state analysis where I have to edit it down from like 25 minutes down to like, you know, two or three to actually do this in real time. Um, okay, so the first thing you'll notice is on the left hand side there is a new menu item for storage and under there you'll see the storage managers. The, uh, the block storage and the object stores there. And though the items for the uh, uh, block store and um, object store is no longer under the cloud element there. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is we'll add a OpenStack cloud provider. And they go through this, it's uh, Kilo, OpenStack, select the provider they got there, uh, non-SSL, and we'll put in the user and password and validate that. Okay. 
and then we'll add it. Okay, uh, and um, the first thing you'll see there when we drill down to the detail for the OpenStack provider is that there's a new line there for storage managers, and you'll see two there. And let's refresh the relationship so we get the data for, for all the uh, information that we're able to link to. We're going to click through to the storage managers, and you'll see that the two new managers that Rich talked about for Cinder and Swift for block and object are now there. Um, and those are also visible under the uh, storage providers uh, link there too. Uh, these are all the managers we've got in the, in the system as opposed to the two that are uh, currently linked through the one OpenStack provider that we were just looking at. Okay, here's the detail page for the Swift manager and uh, you see that we've got a link back to the OpenStack manager and the, the refresh hasn't happened yet so, so there were no uh, block items there yet, but uh, I think at this point the refresh has happened. Let me slow this down a second. Yeah, and uh, we've got two object store containers linked there, and we're going to um, click on those and uh, drill down onto one of them. And here you can see that uh, we've got information from the containers down to the objects. Um, and both the containers and objects have links back to the managers themselves as well as the OpenStack manager as previously seen. Uh, now let's look at the Cinder manager. Cinder manager has a link to the cloud volumes. Uh, and if we drill down to one of those, uh, you'll see that it's also got uh, links back to both the OpenStack manager and the Cinder manager itself. And most of this other information here for both the object stores and the, and the uh, block stores, the volumes, was there before. It's just the only thing that's really different is that the uh, linkages back to the new manager are, are there now. All right. And um, the only thing else we'll show you now is that on the main storage menu, you'll see the same set of object stores and block uh, storage that you could see uh, when you drill down through the uh, manager themselves. So this is the, the full list for the system as opposed to the list that you see for the one uh, provider. And uh, I think that's it. Cool. Uh, there are a couple of questions from Sergio in the chat huh? about storage. The first one is, go ahead, Sergio, you can just ask. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. So the first, uh, the first thing is, have you put that all that information you are showing in the CNU database? So is that available in the CNU? All the links and all the information you have? I have not. Okay. Is there anything there uh, that would have that would be different? That the, I mean, the volumes and the objects were there, would have been there already, right? Yeah, yeah but not the. Board. Yeah, yeah. We, we can take it online. Okay. And what's the other question? Is volume type added to the volumes? Yeah, there's a tag in OpenStack that is called volume type that the administration can put there. It's, it's a generic tag you use to differentiate uh, volume types. Um, was wondering if that's also available. And again, uh, we didn't make any change to that for any of these PRs, but if it would have been there before, it's still there. But if it wasn't there before, we haven't added it. So I, I'd have to go check that. So it just okay. splits things out. Doesn't really add functionality except for kind of making a new manager available, but doesn't add anything uh, new. Is that kind of what yeah, they yeah. yeah. Okay. It's existing inventory okay. in the same tables, actually. Good. Okay. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be adding to it, uh, uh, Sergio, as we, as we go forward here. Thanks. Yep. Slide what? No, the slide. The slide in. You didn't? No. Well, we all saw it. Well, that is efficient. <laughs> this was supposed, supposed to be from last time. Oh, that was the slide from last, uh, last week? Yeah. Do you have, yeah. do you have anything no. to talk about this no. week? No. no. All right. We'll skip over performance. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, so I'm filling in for Dave today. Um, we'll start with uh, manual testing. Uh, we're continuing with uh, with upstream testing, doing both regression testing, 
and looking at the Sprint uh, new features that were demoed in Sprint 46. Out of the 50 uh, deliverables that we identified in there, we have 44 that were looking good, 20% uh, that were blocked in some way uh, or, or had issues that uh, prevented us from testing, and 36% that testing is still in progress on. Next slide, please. Uh, with regards to our automation, uh, we are making progress on being able to test uh, dev provider PRs against the integration test framework. Um, we already have the ability to patch the appliance uh, with a, a branch. Uh, we're going to be uh, making that a little bit more generic so that we can patch the appliance against a PR. Uh, and then we need the ability to trigger these jobs uh, so that you can say, well, I I want to run this particular PR uh, against the testing framework uh, and against this particular version of the appliance. Um, Dev have uh, started including uh, some helper scripts that we were using. Uh, we were manually patching the uh, Manage IQ appliance with some things to help us in the automation uh, front. This was a lot of it to do with uh, debouncing and, uh, and as we said before, knowing when the uh, user interface is ready for us to interact with. So this is hopefully going to give us uh, a lot more stable, uh, you know, access to knowing when the page is ready for us to interact with. So a huge thank you on that. I think that that should be uh, landing for us very, very soon. Um, Navmazing, which is our new navigation framework, we're continuing on the conversion of that. Uh, we've already seen the benefits. Uh, one of the problems with the old navigation was that we would constantly be re-navigating uh, pretty much, I want to say from base principles, uh, we would be going back to the start page a lot of the time and navigating through. The new navigation framework uh, allows us to very easily uh, check to see if we're already on a page. Um, and because of the, the tree-like structure it uses, you know, you, you request to go to a particular page uh, and there may be a prerequisite to get there and then it will try and go to that prerequisite and it will check if it's already there. Uh, and if it's not, it will go to that pre prerequisite. And so it constantly just changed down that, that list of uh, navigation steps. But we're already seeing that the navigation is now much more uh, user-esque experience. Uh, there's, there's not going back to the dashboard page, which was something that we had to do before. Uh, so we've already changed, you can see uh, 677 down to 502 uh, removals of the old force navigate. Uh, once force navigate goes away completely, that means we'll be moved over completely to the new NavMazing uh, framework. And we do have some more of those already in PRs that are yet to be merged. Widgetastic, uh, which is our new uh, page model framework, is, is also taking shape. This is going to allow us to, uh, to interact with the new forms a lot easier, uh, do both reading and writing um, from, from the forms that we have. But currently, we generally just write. Uh, and if we want to read, we have to do something special. Um, and yeah, so Widgetastic is, is really taking shape. Uh, next slide. And out of the pull requests, uh, I said we have 125. It looks like the information that was uh, gathered on the first slide is slightly newer than when I prepared this this morning. So we, uh, we had 125 PRs merged this morning. Uh, and you can see the distribution there. There's a lot for test updates. Uh, there was 33 of those. Uh, and also fixing tests was another 20. So almost half of the um, merges and, and pull requests for the integration tests was updating tests. And you can also see there's a big portion there for framework 30, which is uh, the NavMazing and, and other efforts to enhance our testing framework. So that's, uh, that's it from QE. Cool, thank you. All right. Um, that that was a very, uh, you know, a sprint demo with a lot of different uh, features demoed here. So that was really kind of cool, cool to see. Um, I'm gonna have to look at look at this thing again, <laughs> just just to absorb everything. Um, so lots of great work, guys, uh, all around. Uh, it's it's really kind of fun to see this project just move at such a fast clip. It's really kudos to everyone here. Um, so uh, if there's no more questions out there, uh, we'll do another sprint review in three weeks as always.
And this next one is focused on stabilization of the e-release. And we, Jason and Satoi and I are going to go off and try to make a beta, beta build of this thing. All right. Thanks, everyone.